I am so excited for today's conversation. Uh, as an educator, I love the subject of critical thinking, and I've got like a dream team of people here to talk about it. So welcome. And if you're new here, please hit subscribe, like this video, and stay tuned through the whole conversation. It's going to be awesome. So I'm going to start by asking Daniel to introduce himself, and then we're going to go to Bertha, and then um, I'm going to ask a first question, and we're going to see where it goes from there. I'm Daniel Reed. I'm the uh, founder of the West Virginia Skeptic Society. I'm here in good old central West Virginia in the Mountain State, and hey, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Bertha. I am the Education Director for the Center for Inquiry, a nonprofit organization that promotes reason and science. And I uh, retired from the science classroom after 34 years in the science classroom here in South Florida. So I'm First and foremost, a science teacher. So, and I'm Melanie uh, with Thinking is Power, and I am uh, an educator at a science uh, a science educator at a community college, and promote critical thinking and science literacy through Thinking is Power. So, what we wanted to do today was talk about critical thinking in education, because I think we all realize that it's important, uh, and we all think we do it. Uh, but the question is, what does that look like? And um, are there better ways to do what we're doing? So actually, um, I'm going to start with Bertha and just ask you um, about teaching critical thinking. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, before we started, we talked about what we think as critical thinking. And um, I, I can't speak for all teachers, I can't speak for social studies teachers or math teachers, although I know some of their standards are very critical thinking based, but I, I know, I'll tell you what we in the science department, in the science department, in the science field think is critical thinking, asking questions. Do you agree that that's critical thinking? That's part of, that's an element of critical thinking. Developing and using models like weather models and uh, solar system models, things like that. Planning and carrying out investigations. Yes. Analyzing and interpreting data. Yes. Using mathematics and computational thinking. Yes. Constructing explanations, engaging in argument from evidence, and obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. Yes. Dyer, question. All right. Was that? Well, that the process of science, how, how is that distinguished? Like, is there a, dis, a delineation between teaching science and teaching critical thinking? Well, the process of science, and that's why I'm so excited to be here today. I, it, it includes critical thinking. It includes those aspects. I just read you the next generation science standards, what we call science practices, which you could call process of science. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, what I think what you guys are proposing is adding something to those already very important components. Am I correct? Adding an element, uh, and again, as we talked about prior to the, the show, uh, a uh, an element of skeptical thinking. Exactly. And that, because as we said, operationally defining, I my definition of critical thinking and skeptical thinking, those, those were... Um, those were separate, actually. I mean, they were. If you had a Venn diagram, um, they 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 joined in the middle some places, but I didn't realize how how distinctly I had them actually. I conflated the two. Um, so when you're talking about critical thinking, are you now? Are they no law? Is it skeptical thinking, or is it the same thing? Well, it's. I think that they are. It's it's the Venn diagram. I think that there's parts that are that are distinctly separate, but I think that there's parts that are also together that they overlap. That's my, that's my new paradigm. I had a paradigm shifting moment right before the show. And oh, so, yeah. So that's what happened right before the show. Yes. I had an aha moment. When you all triggered the science teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, okay. So I, oh gosh. I'm so excited about this conversation because, um, you know, Bertha and I in particular have had a lot of conversations over the years mm -hmm. about thinking. 
and Daniel, you and I have started to do that as well. Um, a bit of background. So I teach science at uh, a community college in Massachusetts, uh, and we are um, union. And per union uh, regulations rules, if you teach anything, any course within the science and math division, you are by definition teaching critical thinking. So the assumption is that you're teaching critical thinking. Now, I was teaching a biology class for non-white majors, and I got so fed up with, like, okay, my backstory essentially is I tried to, I, I wondered if I had a single semester to teach the average person what they needed to know about science, what would that look like? And it was not intro bio. So I created a course in this place. It's the teach skills, not facts. And that's where Bertha and I started talking about these skills, which are critical thinking, information literacy, and science literacy. But my definition of critical thinking is now different than what it was. Mm -hmm. So at the time, it was basically inherent to the process of science. Critical thinking is built into that. We know we can teach students what science is found without actually asking them to think critically about it. But even if you ask them to use evidence to come to a conclusion, that is a form of critical thinking. Uh, so Bertha, I pulled up my definition of critical thinking. I have um, being aware that your thinking is flawed and prone to errors. Yes. They think about how they think. They're curious. They separate uh, their beliefs from their identity. Um, being open to criticism, avoiding black and white thinking, and um, being comfortable with uncertainty, having a humility to recognize the limits of your knowledge and being open to being wrong, uh, and uh, using evidence to come to a conclusion and maintaining a healthy level of skepticism. That's gold. That's fantastic. That's gold. And uh, so if we're going to discuss critical thinking and what is lacking in the classroom, mm -hmm. that is lacking in the classroom. So we'll teach the process of science, but why does science work? Because science puts guardrails in place mm -hmm. to avoid, you know, to keep in mind what you just said. So why do we do bubble blind protocol? They teach, they learn. But why do we need a double blind protocol? Because the person doing the experimenting shouldn't be the shouldn't know which group is getting which medicine set. You know, why do we have control groups? Why do we have multiple samples in, a, in each trial? Like, it's all because we we think we want the answer and gosh darn it, our bias is going to lead us to that answer. And so you go look for information online. You taught me this, Melanie. You go look for information online. You're going to go find what you want to find, right? You're going to cherry pick. So I have to be aware that I tend to cherry pick because we all tend to cherry pick. So that's where I absolutely agree with you. In a sense, you're proposing a revolution in science education, in all education. You're proposing to teach why we believe what we believe and how that affects how we process information, not just in the classroom, but everywhere. But, okay, so but taking that into a different field, like, say, outside of science, into English education or civics, so any of the social sciences and things of, of that nature. Yeah, yes, I can only speak to social science because that's my background. But um, they, in, in, all my in all my educational years, um, I, I've not come across any type of uh, curriculum elements of, of a curriculum or so on and so forth, wherein people actually are teaching about cognitive biases, about logical fallacies. Um, and, and so therein is the problem, I think, in education, um, because that element from the sciences, it, it, the, where it's, it's built into, even there, though, I, I've, I've not when I was a science when I was a science person back years ago. Um, I was a science major, once chemistry major, and then bio. It's a long story, but we we didn't learn about cognitive biases. We didn't yeah. learn about logical fallacies, and those are the elements that I think would be very very important and should be taught in today's uh, educational curriculum. Absolutely, thank you, Melanie. She's only taught me this. I. 
Absolutely. Because even in the science process, those, those mention, the things I mentioned, the NGSS practices I mentioned, they're there because of those biases, right? Mm -hmm. Right. You don't openly say, you can be wrong. You should aspire to be less wrong. Mm -hmm. This is why science is set up the way it's set up. Mm -hmm. Don't say that. I've realized in the, because, yes, I mean, I have a graduate degree in science and I did not learn this stuff. I didn't right. learn it. I, and it's so fundamental to the process of science. It's basically philosophy of science kind of built into um, it. And we just assume students are going to pick that up like through an osmosis. Yeah. Or not at all. Like take, I love how you said, the, the important thing is that there's so much misinformation out there right now that some kids or adults too are just going to say, oh, forget it. I don't believe anybody. I don't believe anything. Everything's baloney. But what we have to show is, you know, climate information, climate misconceptions. The difference is that the, 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 the stuff, the science stuff, the IPCC stuff, the EPA stuff, the NOAA stuff went through that process. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I really want this to be right, so I better be careful and check my biases. Okay, let's set up these experiments. Let's try to prove ourselves wrong. What can we mess up on? Here, look at my work. What did I mess up on? Tell me that I'm wrong. That's why it's gone through that process as opposed to just misinformation flying around. So no, not all information is created equally. We have to teach that. You know, you said something there that... Um, it is, I have actually tested this. This is anecdotal. I will fully admit this. Um, but the process of science works by um, trying to prove yourself wrong. And when you can't prove yourself wrong, you become less uncertain. But it's never a process of really breaching absolute certainty. Mm -hmm. Different types of scientific knowledge. There's facts, right? And facts aren't things that are unchanging forever always going to be true even facts can change yes they are um things that have been observed repeatedly and are generally accepted as true there's consensus there's theories there's hypotheses there's laws and all of those things are different types of scientific knowledge it is really enlightening to ask people even with science degrees what is a theory right what is scientific consensus because even they aren't necessarily going to be able to articulate it. Yeah. I, that sort of like um, a basic epistemology in, in science, how the process of science works is so fundamental. And we don't, uh, I teach non-science majors, but we don't even teach this to scientists. Mm -hmm. That's my mini rant so far. Yeah. I, we do teach in, for example, in the Florida Standards Middle School, it says, what is the difference between a law, a theory, a fact, and hypothesis? Uh -huh. What I do is I have the kids line them up in order of importance. And of course, they always put fact at the top and it's actually at the bottom. At the bottom. But the problem is that the word theory is used just like the word organic. When I teach organic chemistry, the word organic is you got carbon. But it's also a milk that has no pesticides, no antibiotics, and you know the deal. Is it okay that there are two definitions for the word organic? I tell my students, yeah, I mean... The, you know, when your mom says at the, in the supermarket, go get me some organic milk and you're being a smart aleck and you bring any old milk and you explain to her that there's carbon in it, you're being a smart aleck. So the word theory, I think it's too late to, I wish we could change what we call a theory in science because that word is absolutely everywhere from cop shows to Reddit. You know, I have a theory about the next book in the series. What do we do? You're saying basic epistemology. You're right. We haven't settled that. I think the definition thing, I'm sorry, the, the definition thing, we're even like arguing over the definition of critical thinking. Yeah, Look, right. have different meanings and their meanings are important, but you're right. We we need to clarify those. Can I say, say maybe it's too late to, to, to clarify theory versus theory? But it's not too late to critic to clarify critical thinking versus skeptical thinking, right? Well, you know that I was going to. I'm not a I'm not a fan of dictionaries <laughs> because to many people say people say that dictionaries give you the definition of the word, and they, they do. But dictionaries give the uses of words, so words have uses, and the uses are contingent upon the context. And the the dictionaries do give those different um, 
those different con words, the, the, the varying meanings of those. But I think it's very important to understand the context in which the word is used. And I, that's one of the things that I think people miss in these kind of conversations. Uh, I'm, I wholeheartedly agree. Theory is misused. Um, literally is misused. Uh, the, you know, it, those, it's, uh, when people say I have a, a theory, I, I will often say, you know, it's a hypothesis and that what makes me not very popular in conversation sometimes. But, um, so I, uh, I, I think that as we talked about at the beginning before there, it's very important to, to operationally define these words but it's you can't you you can't go around doing that in casual conversation. I think the boat, as you said, has sailed on the theory, but has it has it def, has it left for skeptical um, for the the term in terms of skeptical critical thinking skepticism and critical thinking skeptical thinking. I, no, I don't think. But I think skepticism has, in many cases, such a negative context that. Um, even it, it may be hard. It may be hard That's to do true. that. You know, um, I've heard others propose good thinking. Um, I, I don't. I don't know what to replace it with. You know, consensus is another one because you mentioned the IPCC, and um, you know, their report is a consensus statement. And as someone who spends a lot of time online communicating science, I get a lot of, um, well, science doesn't work by consensus. That's just groupthink. No and no. And yes, science does work by consensus, but that word means something different again in science. But <laughs> we don't teach we don't teach those words and, and how that process of science building scientific knowledge works. But I wanted to ask you, Bertha, do your students put like um do they think the law a theory becomes a law? That uh, that happens a lot, yes. And then you teach it. And then the next year, the teacher teaches it and says, you didn't teach this. They think theories become laws. I go, yes, I, I did teach that. They, it's That one is a tough one. And mm -hmm. again, we are on a, we're on a worse galloping to the test at the end of the year. So it's hard for us to spend a lot of time on any of these individual standards. So um, part of that, I, I think, though, you know, with the fact that I work with a multitude of these of students who come in every day and give me multiple stories about what so and so said that so and so said that so, yeah, the the idea that those students, I think they you can sit there and tell them something like I will give them scholarship information, and I will say here is this inform here fill this out da 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 da. And then they will come back later and say, well, you didn't give me that. Yes, I did. We had that conversation. You were standing right here. Remember, I gave you, I did. And so that, that, that I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not uh, trying to excuse that, that they, they said that, but that is a common thing that I see every day. Oh, yeah. That happens a lot. Um, but I, I still think regardless of what we call it, you guys are hitting on something absolutely essential we need to teach people don't believe everything you believe yes let's see how you view your lens and your lens is a lens that you're viewing through bias and perception through identity through past experience all of the information that you're processing is going through this lens you need to realize that when you process information be it in the classroom or on instagram but back Many years ago, when I used to teach psychology and and uh, theories of personality and things like that, when I would have my students tell, when they said to me, "I think this," I would say, or if they would write it in a report, or if they would if they would say it to me, I say, "You need to follow that statement up with because I think this because," and then list for me your reasons and your rationale for why you believe this or why you think that, and. To me, when I was the, their professor, it was not acceptable for them to just simply say, I think blah, 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 and not give me any rationale. Um, so I, I, I think that, um, and again, the other thing that, that dawned on me a while ago when you were saying that facts change, I used to say to the students, at one point it was a fact 
that that uh, humans could not walk on the moon. Um, that was true at one point in time, but as time has as things have changed, as new facts, as new information has become available, that fact has changed. So, you know, I, I mean, it's I don't see those sorts of things being taught in the social science fields, um, but I do see them being taught in other other areas, like you said, like the sciences. Not as well as we should, though. Not as not as well as you should, and I have conversations with science teachers, and so, you know, we'll talk about cognitive biases. We'll talk about, and it's not something that generally, I find that we find interesting. It's not. I mean, we. I love saying to the kids, "Did you reject your hypothesis? Is it okay to reject mm -hmm. your hypothesis?" Some of them try to change, to go back and change their hypothesis. I go, "No, I'm going to mm -hmm. if you change it." Leave it alone, explain in your conclusion why it's wrong, because based on the evidence. But do we openly discuss cognitive bias, perceptions, identity? No. So I think, Melanie, you are, with your course, Science for Life, you've gotten, you have the foundation, you have the platform ready to go if anybody wanted to adopt this, right? I mean, I, I do. I, so what happened for me was, again, I got tired of teaching intro bio. And um, went to the department and I said, I think we need to have a conversation about why we teach gen ed science. And, you know, science literacy and critical thinking, yes, yes, yes. Okay, do our courses do that? And I made the case that biology wasn't doing it. As interesting as I think biology is, I'm a biologist. So um, the course that I, 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 I my husband said that I, I went into like a mind cave for several years. And what I was trying to do was come up with this course for what, what would this single semester look like? It seems like a really high, the stakes are high, but this is the last course they're ever going to get. Wow. So, so what I, what I ended up with is um, a course that honestly, it doesn't get to the process of science until after the midterm. And that used to scare the poo out of me, but I've shared this with enough other people um, that, that they see the benefit of it as well. So what I do is I, I start with, you know, I lecture on uh, witches, the witch trials from Europe. Okay. They're all, they really were convinced they were right. How good was their evidence? Right. I, what I'm trying to get them to do is think about their own thinking and their, their own beliefs. And then the limits of our perception and memory. And I fool them to show them they can be fooled. And we, we do um, optical illusions, and auditory illusions, and, and we play memory games. And you know what? There's a reason science journals aren't filled with, I tried it and I felt better, so it works. <laughs> right? Um, so we talk about that. And then we go into biases and fallacies. And I have another course, um, Environmental Science, that is also for known majors that starts like a traditional science course with the scientific method and here's the steps and then here's everything that we know at a focus level in this topic. And I find it so abrupt because I haven't laid a justification right. for science to begin with. Like you were saying, Bertha, why do we need control steps? And why do we why do we design why do we need science at all? Why isn't I saw it when it's real sufficient? Why do we believe the IPCC more than we do uh, the Heartland Institute? Um, but I don't mean to, I don't think this is hyperbole when I say you guys are proposing a revolution. Right. <laughs> One thing it's, this should start in a kindergarten. Yes. Yes. But how do we implement it? Because you've had, and we've discussed this, Melanie, the luxury of time. I've had a test, state test, a biology test at the end of the year with typical critical thinking questions you know like here's a graph here's your experiment what are the results Wh what went wrong you know the the florida uh, biology end of course exam is full of really great stuff like that where the kids really have to think about why this experiment went well or didn't go well and analyze the data and all that kind of critical thinking what what you're suggesting not taught okay so let's just say that this is the moment the revolution starts now okay Ta -ta -ta -ta. I, I'll tell you what I was. I presented in Denver a couple weeks ago. The National Science Teachers Association conference, forty five hundred attendees, and one of my sessions was called "Don't Believe What You Believe." It was jam packed. Uh huh. Are interested? 
especially because of the the fire hose of misinformation, disinformation that's heading our way, being an election year and and just AI and everything else. I think teachers are like, oh crap, I got to teach my kids to protect themselves against this information. But where is are we implementing this? I get. I have to think pragmatically, like where in a classroom and how often, when do we implement this? I think it should be like a theme that underlines the classroom. Yeah, this is... it, I have a question and then Daniel, feel free to go ahead. Um, is misinformation in the standards? No, what I've learned, um, for example, um, the National Center for Science Education had a, they polled high school science teachers how many introduce intelligent design? And a lot of the, I think 25% of the teachers who introduced it, I might be wrong on the numbers. They introduced it on purpose to explain why it's wrong. Oh. Huh. Okay. When I teach climate change, I tell them, follow the money. Uh -huh. The Harland Institute is an excellent example. They make all their money's coming from energy uh, in the, the industry. Does everybody do that? No. When I do that, do I get a little nervous that I'm going to get a phone call? Yes. Uh -huh. So I, I, I was brave. No, I don't think. Now, in language arts, they're talking about finding credible sources. Right. Right. But, but misinformation is misinformation explicitly in the standards. I don't want to speak for other states, but in the Florida science standards, no. Are they in, I don't know what Massachusetts is doing. Well, okay. So what I heard was um, in Florida, and you adopted a, a version of the generation science standard, right? Well, it's, they're, they're great. They're good, actually. The, the standards are good as, as right now. It's yeah. not a version of Florida has their own. It's called the Sunshine State Standards. But some states did adopt a version, yes. Okay. So I guess my question is, uh, in the science standards, misinformation is not mentioned. And what might be mentioned is finding reliable sources. Uh-huh. Right. But then, okay, so they, so the, the public ed teachers that I'm aware of, they will teach, like, I, there's a couple of English teachers that I know that are excellent about teaching students the way to find out if a source is credible or not. Um, but the vast majority, just like we talked about a while ago when the students would, with the scholarship, I handed you that scholarship. We just literally talked about this. So then they'll go to a, from that teacher's classroom to another teacher's classroom. And they, that, that information doesn't necessarily generalize from or that, that skill set generalized from this one to that one. I find that, and again, this this gets into, a, I, I guess, a, a deeper discussion in terms of, or a side discussion on how that info, how we get people to generalize those skills from this area to that area. Yeah, um, and and I, that's, I, I think that's beyond the kin of. You got to talk about like education, uh, pre-service pre teachers. You got to talk about, schools of education at the university and community right. level and in right. this. Um, I do want to say one of my education programs, I'll just plug this a little bit here. It's called Generation Skeptics, generationskeptics.org. Mm -hmm. We have wonderful lessons ready to go with free lesson plans. Everything's free, downloadable. Mm -hmm. Kids about misinformation, um, disinformation, malinformation, pseudoscience, mm -hmm. um, investigating claims and things like that. So www.generationskeptics.org. Everything's free. Contact me if there's something uh, you think I should have there that I don't. Melanie's site is there for example. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I actually used that both of your si those sites for Critical Thinking Awareness Day. Uh, oh. And so we took those, we took, I, I actually broke them down by um, age level and put them on our website. So like if you're a, if you're a, a kindergarten, air, middle school, high school, college, and so on and so forth. And so um, broke those down. I will tell you that 
one of the activities I was telling Melanie this yesterday, the uh, which line is longer mm -hmm. activity for the sixth grade. I, I went into a number of their classrooms at my school that day and watched what was happening. And the, the teacher earlier, she came to me and she said, hey, you need to come and watch this. These kids are eating this up. My first period did. So I came into the next, the subsequent. It was amazing to watch those kids argue and debate and no, no, this is what, and the teacher was going, how do you make the determination which line is longer? And she was asking those sorts of questions. And I was so proud of that moment. And there's little, they're not little tykes, but there's folks in there doing that. It was amazing to watch and they had fun doing it. And so that's the thing. I, I think that if some, if we're, if, if this is to be um, accepted, if this is to be uh, implemented, I think, you know, when you remember things, there are things that you remember things that are, you don't remember a day at the park that was just a normal, happy every, you know, you remember the day when the tornado came through and the, that's the thing that sticks with you. Well, you or, found or you found a, or um, the, the, the philosophers, they, they called it the slap in the face method back in the, where they would tell them something allegedly and slap the person in the face and they're like, ah, oh, that's, now you'll remember that. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Or... Classroom these days. You What's know, that? It's going to be fun. That's what, what, gotta, if we can have fun with it, that's what's going to make the impact. So on, based on that, first of all, thank you. That makes my heart sing. I can't wait to tell the person who developed that lesson with me about that story. Secondly, as a teacher, I have to teach the gun safety. I have to teach the say no to drugs. I have yes. the emotional... Uh, the curriculum I have to teach the uh yes family so i implore everyone listening and i implore you guys like this shouldn't just be on my shoulders i am already a counselor a teacher a mother a nurse a pe coach a nutritionist and uh and a tutor and a calendar can we spread this out one of the things i'm doing in generation skeptics is i'm in the middle right now creating a camp programming booklet where the lessons are going to be modified. We're about two weeks from finishing. So today's April 3rd, 2024. In about two weeks, we're going to have a camp programming booklet where camps can take that, take this information free again and implement it at summer camps. I think news organizations need to start bringing this up. I think it should be all over social media. It can't just be on my shoulders. And my, I mean, teachers, capital T. Can I, I want to interject it, that? I absolutely, with Critical Thinking Awareness Day, it took me forever to get the media to get involved. And so finally, um, there's one, there's a, uh, a reporter that she and I have a very good rapport. She did an article on the West Virginia Skeptic Society for the newspapers all through the state, um, through the two, two of the largest um, distributed uh, newspapers in the state. And so she did a follow-up article on Critical Thinking Awareness Day. So it got out that way. Uh, the only way I could get the news, the, the local news stations, there's like four, three or four or five in the state to cover it, was uh, when the university got involved and released that they were promoting Critical Thinking Awareness Day. So to get the media involved in this, the, the, the news, it's, I, I think one person said that it's it's not exactly um, it's not exactly how did she say it? not exactly um, I shouldn't say newsworthy but she didn't say it, you know it wasn't breaking news it wasn't one of these things critical thinking awareness skills hit this high, all time high point today you know we don't we don't hear those sorts of things and we're back you were saying Daniel that some teachers poo poo your idea of putting this into the classroom, into the skeptical. Yeah, because it's, it, I think that it's not, they don't necessarily, A, they don't necessarily see the, the relevance to their subject um, as it, as a sort of a cross-curricular sort of thing. It's, it's more of a, oh, that's, that's a nice brain teaser sort of thing, or that's, a, but um, I think it's real, when they do see, when they do finally see that the students are when we had critical thinking awareness day and we had these recommended um 
activities, when they picked some and they saw that the kids were so engaged, they they loved it. They thought it, they, I mean, the excitement that was generated when the teacher came and said to me, hey, you've got to come down here and see what these these guys are doing. It's it's amazing. That made, I just felt, I just was a, a, so, I don't know. I don't have the words to describe. It just, it just absolutely overwhelmed me the response that I got from some of the, of the people. So maybe it's the presentation. Maybe it's the, because if you came to me and said, it's critical thinking day, let me help you. I'm going to say, young man, step out of my classroom. I've been doing this for 34 years. Right. If you came to me and said, hey, you know, I think we, if I'm proposing that we teach kids about biases and perceptions and identities and how this influences how we process information, I'm going to go, oh, wow. Yeah, I've never, that's true. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. So it might be a matter of how it's introduced. Because what the first time I heard Melanie say, you know, teach skills, I'm like, I said, it was like a firecracker under my cl my classroom desk. I'm like, what, who are you to tell me? I've been doing this for, I do teach critical thinking. I've been doing, but like your definition of critical thinking, A, it's absolutely essential. I am totally on your team now. B, I didn't realize that's what you guys were calling critical thinking. Right. And I didn't, I didn't realize, I mean, again, I had a paradigm shift at the beginning of this. Um, because I was like, oh, wait a minute. I thought we were talking about the same thing, but we weren't. And um, that's good stuff to know because that's the same thing that I think is happening everywhere. So I have a question for you too, because um, based on what I'm hearing you say is aligning with something that I think is fundamental to the problem here, which is that the educators themselves don't know this content, regardless of what it's called. Right. Perhaps right. teachers aren't aware of cognitive biases and logical fallacies and the limits of our perception and memory and how we can fool ourselves. Most educators themselves are not aware of it. And if you're not aware of it, you can't teach it. I agree. Yes. I, I, the question you, is, if that's true, then what do we do about it? That's you have two obstacles. You have, it's not a standard, as you were uh -huh. asking about the Florida standards. I'm going to assume that in most states, it's not a standard. Number two, it's a thing. And even teachers have those biases. Uh -huh. and it does, you have to really start with that humility. I can be wrong. How many, if, I always say to the kids, now that I've learned from you, like how I can't, not 100% of what I believe can possibly be true. Right. And then I think back of what I thought about 20 years ago. I went to a chiropractor, you mm -hmm. know, stuff like that. Uh, how you change over time. These are the two big obstacles for me. A, how how do we teach it if it's not in the standards, which most teachers that just honestly, they're just doing their best to teach the standards. And mm -hmm. I think they're doing a good job. B, how do we drill that humility? And yeah, you're you're in this too, my friend. You're you also have biases. How are those two op Those are the two obstacles that I think we have to overcome. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. Obviously, number one. Um, number two, I think the same premise that we 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 touched upon earlier. And I don't remember if this was in our pre pre show um, chat or not, but to get folks early and so like so for example if we started if we started something in or the and by we i don't mean us i mean society in general if we started teaching students at an early age about these sorts of things then eventually you would have that it would take years but eventually those types of um thought processes would then become natural and and embedded into their cognitive schema and would be a part of them. And so it's not something we're not going to, it, it was like, it's like turning the Titanic. It's, it's something that we're going to have to, it's, it has to happen slowly, in my opinion. And I think that the way to, and I'm going to say this with sort of tongue in cheek, to skirt the, um, the issue of the standards is to have classes for um, education majors, maybe particularly early education majors and so on and so forth, 
where they learn to incorporate these things into their everyday uh, classroom standards. Okay, I have this standard where I'm supposed to teach, um, oh, I don't know, sharing, or I'm supposed to have some sort of character education standard or some, something. Though then, in their mind, then through their training, go look for things that could incorporate yeah. skeptical thinking, critical thinking into that into their, their pedagogy. Well, first, Melody has the course ready to go, right? So the first thing is to promote the fact that Science for Life is there and ready to go. Secondly, I'm inclined, again, as the person in the classroom that is overwhelmed with everything I have to do. Right. And the discipline issues that people are facing these days that have never been faced before. Mm -hmm. I'm inclined to say social media. Melanie, you have these little three-minute, four-minute, tell us about those. Those five-minute clips, you sent me a couple. Those are gold. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if, and if a teacher just started a class every day with one of those 10 minute clips about what, you know, identifying the, the pseudoscience in, in, uh, foods packaging. Like as a bell ringer activity, uh, a bell ringer or, a or, a, or an anticipatory set or, yep. So I think the first thing is everybody should follow generation skeptics and thinking is power. And definitely use your videos. That you know, um, I we're in a TikTok generation, and so trying it's really hard to distill content down to that. But um, yeah, it's it's nice to know that those are landing. So thank you for saying something. It doesn't look like it's hard at all. They are really, really good, Melanie. Oh, thanks. They are. You know, I post them to the our Facebook group. I go, I will go through. I try to share the love amongst all the people that I that I. But I I I will find things that you've posted and think to myself, okay, this is going to. And I look. I always look at the views and how many views they get, and so on and so forth. And I, you know, your stuff, as Bertha said, is it's golden. Um, so. Have you considered adding hashtags like uh, ELA and English language arts and STA? Like, I don't, I hate, I'm not a big social media person. So how do you get someone who's not on your site to find it? You know, that's a really good question. I have not figured out hashtags and Instagram in particular is just kicking my butt. I do not understand Instagram. Facebook is my biggest site and I, I like Facebook because it allows for more interaction and a longer form content. I can post everything from videos to links to articles. Um, but yeah, the, the other sites I, I really struggle with. I have not thought about ELA, uh, hashtag. That's a, a really good one. Sometimes when I have to do, like, I have to make an announcement, I go to every state science teacher association page on Facebook and cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. And we got a lot more likes and followers that way. Cause I, I think teachers want this. If they don't how did they shop on it? What are you doing? I don't understand. I, go to, I start with the A's, right? Alaska Science Teachers Association. Boom. Find their page. Sometimes you can post immediately. Sometimes you have to send a private message to the administration and admin and say, hi, could you post this on your page? Most of them you could just post. Uh, National Association of Biology Teachers, NSTA, all the teacher groups that I find, all the counseling groups that I find. So I Post, 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 just to get the message out there. So I tried that with the Critical Thinking Awareness Day for the state. Um, I contacted, because I used to be a member of the West Virginia Science Teachers Association. I was not a science teacher. It was a weird story how I got, as I was a member, but nevertheless, um, I contacted the person that's in charge of that, and she said, this is the quote that I got from, she said, the board will have to vote on that or the board will have to approve that. Not vote, not necessarily vote, but the board will have to approve that. Well, you send me the information and I'll present it to the board. And I'm going, okay. And I did and nothing ever resulted from it. Yeah. Uh, I think because I was like an official day, uh -huh. it might have been something a little bit more uh, in involved. But just like, hey, check out this video on how to sell pseudoscience. Check mm -hmm. out this video on um, Pexitani Bill. With the Announcing um, that, sorry, uh, that that's gonna get posted. And then I had I, I con the the counseling folks, and I have to be careful here. The I co I contacted the counseling folks and said, "Hey, could you announce and promote this?" And 
it, it didn't get promoted um, the way that I had hoped that it would because they said, well, this we have a public relations department that announces those sorts of things. And then I sent it to the public relations department and I, it didn't get a response. So, um, so it was, it was difficult. It was a challenge to get, um, word out through media because again, it's not, I don't, I think it's one of those things that people look at. It's like a Rubik's cube. It's a nice little thing to, it's a nice little puzzle. It's a nice little thing to, as a, as a entertainment or a site, you're, you're, oh, you're doing this this lot, which line is longer, or you're looking at the skeptical birding. That was another one that, and, and that's, that's interesting. But then, but once they do it, that's the thing. Once they do it, they see the value of it, but it's the getting them to see it. But. Yeah. I also feel like, um, with critical thinking, so it's not enough to know how you have to want to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That motivation aspect is really challenging. Like critical thinking is hard work. You have to turn it on. You have to question your thought processes and what you already believe. You have to be willing to to put in some serious effort. And it's just easier not to. So most of the time we just don't. And um, I always use the what's the harm question. You know, like what harm could come. Um, but the other way of doing it is to, this stuff can just be fun. So, Daniel, you're in Bigfoot country, are you not? Right. Yes, I'm in. I'm in every kind of cryptic country you can imagine. We have Bigfoot, Flatwoods Monster, Mothman, the the, the trifecta of cryptids. Awesome. Okay, so uh, my students just finished their Bigfoot case study, and I didn't come up with this yet. Um, Matt Rowe did, and it, it's a brilliant case study where it asked students to, there was a um, ketchup, uh, there was a veterinarian yes. study who found DNA proof. Yes. Of cryptid of Bigfoot and um, not only proof but that Bigfoot was um, a cross between a female human and a male unknown hominin yeah so we got some interesting kinky stuff going on there but that's what she got because it was mitochondrial DNA uh -huh. nuclear DNA well wow. okay so she put out this study and i have my students look at it and evaluate it and they're like well this looks really sciencey wow the dna yeah oh god proof okay well here is a world renowned geneticist's response to like here's how he evaluated the dna and it turns out every single one of them can be linked to um either an extant uh species like dogs and cows or in a couple of cases, he actually found extinct um, mammals, but known ones. Uh -huh. So I have my students look through those, evaluate those, evaluate the, the the places they were published, and apply Occam's razor, mm -hmm. and then critically through this. And it's flipping, really, and also it's Bigfoot, so it's amazing. Now it turns out that Ketchum study, uh -huh. she actually created a journal uh -huh. to study because it wasn't good enough to be published elsewhere and the right. link now is no longer even active you have to go through the time machine to get there um but it's such a brilliant example of next level pseudoscience and all of it's a, a series of detective work and critical thinking and applying the process of science and information literacy to a topic that is really interesting mm -hmm. that's that's why i think a, a camp setting like an er, not not the archery canoeing camp setting, but the urban STEM camp type setting uh -huh. is a good place for this because you can go further. The other place I think it would really work is gifted classrooms because those uh -huh. teachers have a more freedom to explore resources than a teacher who's galloping her way to the, the end of the year exam. I, do you have this on your page, the, the Bigfoot lesson that you created around this so that one is on the, um, there's a National Center for Case Study Teaching in Science. And it Lots is the DNA stuff from the true genetics. Yes. Okay. However, um, uh, so that case study is a bit old and I have worked with Matt. I have his, his blessing on this, but I have an updated version, including a version that can go asynchronous online. So if anybody wants that from me, let me know. I want it from you. I'd love to link to it on Generation Skeptics. Ooh, I should put that in the format where you can get to. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I could use it to put on under my 
is is would you think it would be more appropriate for a high school or college level? Oh, I do it with my students, but absolutely high school. Okay, so I could I could link to it and put it onto our critical thinking awareness page. There's also so, an yeah. extension of it that um because the case study was originally the Loch Ness monster using the oh. It's just that there was an introduction on the Bigfoot thing, so I expanded the Bigfoot thing, and then there's the um you know like. You can use the principles of ecology to evaluate the evidence for the Loch Ness monster. And right. a great, great case study. That's very NGSS. Um, uh, really? It sits right into NGSS. Yes. Even though it's misinformation, like cryptid. Yeah. I think that's. They love. They, they really promote case study type things like that, where the kids get a bunch of information and have to work through it. What they don't do is like, for, I have case studies like that in my class where they're actually looking at the deer population versus the wolf population, real populations, and figuring out what's going on. And they get all the information and they have to draw their own conclusions. All you're doing is fitting in the whole um, uh, extraordinary claims, required mm -hmm. extraordinary evidence, and looking at some of the things like Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster, but it totally, totally fits in there. We had a STEM day um, at school, and so I had a table set up, and I went through uh, basically evaluating claims and, and looking at things uh, like Bigfoot, UFOs. I showed pictures of UFOs and showed, how, okay, so this was a picture, you know, the classic hubcap that's flying through the air. That So I showed them that, and they were like, well, that's just, the, the kids could, it's amazing to me how they're they look at the older things and they goes well that's just photoshop photoshop didn't exist then and so we 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 went through that process and uh you know we we did uh one of the things that um were i had planned on doing for this year i don't know that it's actually going to happen or not but we were going to do a uh, where they make their own uh like i would go into the some of the classrooms and they would make their own fake photographs because that means yeah, I know what it is. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and so the, I think the whole, I think the whole presentation that I did lasted like 15 minutes and they cycled through. Um, and so that, it, as you were saying, it fit into the STEM and the teacher, the, the person who was heading that up at our school said the kids loved it. I mean, I, that was the, res the feeling that I got, but the, the information that they got back, um, the kids did like it. So they're going to have me do it again next year. So, That's you know, awesome. all the, What's that? No, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I, it sort of cut out on me there for a sec. The, yeah, uh, but, but no, I, I, I think that again, it's imperative. It is imperative. I think that a, the kids find it to be fun, and when the when the teachers see that the kids are having fun with it, that's when they're going to then, I, I can, I can guarantee. I've not talked with the teacher, but I can guarantee you, next year they will somehow. If we didn't have critical thinking awareness day for where they would somehow incorporate that which line is longer into their everyday uh, or into a lesson somewhere. I think it's got to be fun. Teachers have to see it. And then, then, which is this was the point that I was going to go to a while ago with the standards and teaching the teachers. If we could get to the teacher education programs and and have them to incorporate some of this stuff even if it were just a few here and there hit and miss till we finally connected with more and more um so that they could say okay here are some things to incorporate that are it's not going to be any any, any extra work for the teachers this if they have to teach this standard here's a way they could do it that also teaches students how to look uh, at sources of information it teaches them about cognitive biases. It teaches them about logical fallacies. I don't know. Just that's just a thought. Your 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 course is ready to go, Melanie. That's exactly what he's promoting there. Yeah, I, I guess I would say um, I would love to get the content and the course out there in a more broadly. I don't know how to do that. I mean, I teach it online, and anybody can sign up for it. But you know, it's still a college class. You have to pay for the tuition. Mm -hmm. Um, I I would love to figure out a way to make this more broadly available. So if you or anyone watching has any ideas, that would be amazing. The other thing is if you're an educator and you're watching this and you're, you have ideas about how we can reach more educators, 
know, please let us know. Um, because obviously we're we're struggling with this as well. I mean, to to put a so teacher education um, programs already have pretty standard courses that mm-hmm. they and their schedules are full. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, a science for life course like this would fit into that. But where would you put it, and how would you get it offered at those colleges? Or is there another way? But I'm inclined to go with the just share your social media, have kids, people just get it sitting in their couches at home with their cell phones in front of them. But they they are all depending upon the institution of higher education. They have they have elective courses, and they could also they could perhaps be persuaded to have it as a recommended elective for the program. Uh, like for example, the program that uh, that I was familiar with at the institution, one of the institutions where I used to teach, they had a behavior management class, not a behavior management class, a behavior disorders class, or something back then that was a recommended elective. It wasn't part of the normal flow of things, but it was one of the recommended electives. And a number of the students took that, uh, that course because they liked the instructor. The instructor was fun. You know, um, I had a number of kids, I had students in the science department take my human sexuality class because, well, it was a class about sex. And so that it, but it fit in with their electives because I taught uh, reproductive anatomy in that class. Um, and so, uh, that it was, it was a, 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 a class that complemented. The other thing is, as, at least as, as I'm thinking about it, um, yes, they do have a lot of the institutions in our state, they have moved from, uh, to, from a, a higher level of required courses to requiring 120 hours. Uh, as a standard, and that's what they've moved toward that. But just because they have moved toward that doesn't necessarily mean that that all students are going to just take the 120 hours and have done with it. There may be some that would take um, take a class, an extra class here and there. But I think here's the thing that I'm hearing as a social science person. When you say science for life, to me, oh, that's a science class. I am a social study, social science person. And so then you're going to have that sort of, oh, I'm going to skip, skip one by it. I, I think that, I think that how it is, and, and please don't take, don't take that. I, I don't know. I don't mean that in any. Uh, no, I understand. And to clarify the reason that it is, is because um, of how our curriculum works. I had right. within the biology department. So okay. we had a little biology class and was adhering to that framework. But if you if you were to pitch that to other schools and title it something else, um, at, at, you know, I mean, there's there are people in 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 that are connected with CFI and they're connected that are that are college professors into what they could take that and in, incorporate it into their if they would be willing to I mean that to say hey here's a proposed class for our for our department um, I think, um that don't believe everything you believe right great title and I mean I know that's our our tagline for generation skeptics but I don't own I don't own that mm-hmm we're thinking is power. We're thinking is power. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Just putting it out there. I mean, the reason I did that for my site was because, you know, knowledge is great, but there's just too much to know. Right. And right. so instead of, and we have access to basically all of humanity's knowledge in our pockets. So um, when you want information, can you find it and can you use it to make better decisions? So I was, I was trying to reframe. My, I guess my broader part, and, and I should clarify, I find communication on um, my social media channels a little challenging because um, it's not organized in the way that I've done it in my class. So right. in my class, there is a linear progression where I start students from the from the basics and we build up throughout the semester. And they come in the funnel of social media. They can come from any number of ways. And 
like for example, when I post about homeopathy, oh, he boy. would not have seen any of the information about being skeptical, about understanding the limits of your personal experiences, about alternative explanations, about you know all of that kind of stuff. All you know is I've used homeopathy and I feel better. And this post says something about homeopathy that I don't like. Yeah. So I find the linear progression that I often joke that my students are captive for a semester and they have to stay with me because they want to grade. Um, That's why you start. Everything has to start with be careful. You are the easiest person to fool. Uh -huh. How do you feel homeopathy immediately? How does that make you feel? And then proceed from there and recognizing in which direction you're, you're heading. You know what I mean? I love hearing you talk about this stuff because you actually make me think about my own stuff in a way that I hadn't thought about it before. The first thing, yeah. How, okay, this topic, how do I feel about it? Now proceed with that already there. That Feynman quote leads everything that I do. The you were the first principle is you must not fool yourself and you were the easiest person to fool. But here's that that is something else that's difficult. Like if you just tell the average person that they can be fooled, they'll be like, sure. I'm too smart for that, right? They don't really believe yeah, you. They don't, they don't think. I was doing a radio show in um, the West Coast of Florida. And boy, I was having a great time with the host while we were talking about political conspiracies and election fraud and things like that. But the minute I brought up that I have a lesson on GMOs, which are perfectly harmless, oof, I get, I get a nerve. <laughs> mm -hmm. I could just feel it i could hear it in her voice that the tension that i get her bias what was it is lee mcintyre i think in in his i think it was lee that had written about what is the line of demarcation um about what you believe and what you what you're skeptical of and where is that line and so you know for example they may say oh well bigfoot that's a bunch of hokum um but then oh no gmos are real and so it may have been it may have been Mick West's book, but I think it was Lee Lee McIntyre's book, um, How to Talk to a Science Denier. I think. So. Yeah, that's his book. Yeah, I, I think it's it, in there, but I I can't remember where I. But but like for example, with the Bigfoot folks, you have um, they have people who are of the mindset that it is a physical actual creature, and then you have the folks who believe that it is some sort of interdimensional being. And so, yeah, so they're not, it's not of this world. It's not even, it's beyond even alien. Some of them think that it's alien. And then there's those who think that it's inter, interdimensional being. So it's interesting when I've been at some of these conferences to watch uh, these big things. Are there interdimensional being, beings or is it only Bigfoot? Oh, no. The Mothman's interdimensional, could be interdimensional as well. Interdimensional. Some of them, not all of them. I mean, you can't broadly generalize like that. Broad strokes, broad strokes. There are are there things that are cryptids interdimensional? Well, I don't know. I'd have to ask some, I, I, you know, like, give me an example. Like, well, like, are humans a cryptid in another dimension? Perhaps. I mean, we're getting, that's, that's deep. That's, we might be, if there's some weakening in the fabric of space time and people see us just carrying on our daily lives and they think that we are, um, you know, some ghost in some other dimension. Anyway. Um, but anyway, there's that line of demarcation about, and, and Bertha, with, with what you were saying about in terms of what people believe and what they don't, what they'll accept. They're okay with these conspiracy theories, but not those. Yeah. yeah. I, almost every time that I'm talking with someone, it, it surprises me um, how they're, everyone knows misinformation is a problem. Mm -hmm. And everyone knows that people need to think critically, but that's always someone else's problem. Right. It, it, Always someone else is not thinking critically and falling for misinformation. Right. But when you hit theirs, it's like, oh no, but that psychics are real. I'm a psychic. Or no, dowsing is real. Dowsing works. Or no, homeopathy works. Well, full moon. Literally. Oh God. Yes. Like the full moon. There's always something. And I'm sure I have one too. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and so th 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 they will, I guess maybe someone would would uh, offer the argument. Well, so, y you know, here's yours. You know, you guys are, you, uh, you have this bias toward being non-biased. You know, I mean, that's. Uh, oh, so. no, I'm not biased. 
is everyone else's plan. Yeah, yeah. That would be part of it. Just explore your own. Write them down. Right. Break them down. So what, after we've talked about this, uh, and for the, what, what could be some next steps? What could we do? Yeah, because at the beginning of this conversation, we started the revolution. Yeah, so we've got, we, we, you know, let's let's form an action plan. My tiny little part of this is generation skeptics promoting uh, clubs at schools. I have some some clubs at the uh, middle school level, high school level, college level. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for club sponsors for any educators that are out there. We're offering $500 stipends to start generation skeptics clubs at their schools. Um, trying to get into the camps. I've been going to several camps here in South Florida and, and doing skeptical birding and doing the Scooby-Doo in mm -hmm. the hot suit of science. Um, trying to get it, articles and newsletters, teacher newsletters. There's going to be one in the National Middle Level Science Teachers Association newsletter, um, the California one, I think though Virginia's looking into it. So just, just getting the information out there. Mine has been uh, the website and the social media accounts, just trying to get as much of this content out there as possible, including educators. But I really want to reach more educators. I, I've done some professional development with educators. I want to do more. Or I, I, um, ha so um, I have a, a colleague, John Cook, uh, a friend and colleague uh, who is the creator of Cranky Uncle amazing game if you've not played it you should all play cranky and gold and i was asking him early on about um thinking his power and like how do i reach more people and he wisely told me that go after educators because with every educator you get all of their students not only now mm -hmm. but but i have found that a really difficult nut to crack mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i agree well for me, it's been Critical Thinking Awareness Day and getting that started in the state. I did an article for the Skeptical Inquirer website that explained and outlined how I went about doing that and hopefully encouraged other people. And I sort of, I threw down the gauntlet and I said, hey, how could you do this in your state and do something similar? That way it basically would give a formalized um, stamp of approval that this is a genuine um, a thing. This isn't. This isn't some because you can't promote a a specific agenda in terms of that's one of the rules. Like so, you you can't do something like I really wanted to do a Doctor Who awareness day. They're not going to let me do a Doctor Who awareness day, or you know, my wife's really great baker day, that sort of thing. And she really is. Um, they wouldn't let me do that. But if it's something that promotes the general welfare of the public at large, and they'll let you do that. Um, so that's the thing I've, I've done and I'm trying to build that. And I want, I want other places to do it. It's my hope and my goal that other places would do it, do it bigger and better. And that we could eventually get more and more people on board with that. Um, and I want to do it bigger and better here next year. So, that's that's what I'm doing, but um, I'll be honest with you. I feel like when I see the the mountain of of foolishness that's out there, it gets overwhelming. It's like, how do you combat this this with this? You know what I mean? It's but then I then I think about the fact that how do you eat an elephant? Although Daniel, what I would say um, is that I don't think critical thinking can solve all of our problems, but I think it's our best chance. Yes, I absolutely. So you like I see the mountain and I don't I don't know how to address the flood mm -hmm. right coming at me. I I really think critical thinking is our our best chance at doing it. And, you know, the rational, the, the, the counselor in me understands what is, what is a rational expectation versus an irrational expectation. And um, still, I'm human. And 
even though I know that it's not rational for me to believe that the whole world, the whole of the world, or even my little sp chunk of it, is going to change in in ten years and twenty years, um, I still feel like I need to make that effort, um, and hopefully more and more because I didn't used to do this. Uh, you know, I I I started. Ben Radford set me down this path. And after Ben, uh, Kenny Biddle. And after Kenny Biddle, Susan Gerbing, so on and so forth. All of these people have contributed to helping me do the things that I've done. And um, I'm hoping that somewhere the concentric circles, the ripple that we send out, will eventually start to assuage some of this, to, to, to erode the mountains, to erode, to erode the mountains. What I just heard was, um, hopefully someday soon, someone is going to be doing something and listing you in that um, list of names of people that inspired them to make yeah. a change. Yes. And you know, from a counseling perspective, that was a very good paraphrasing and, and, and check for understanding. That was, that was really good. Pat on the back. Good <laughs> 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 day today. All right, so do we have anything for closing? We've been on here for an hour and 11 minutes and six seconds. So I think that, I, I think we could probably go, we could talk and talk. I mean, I know I could, because um, that's how I roll until Melanie tells me to shut up. Um, okay, I'm shutting up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I see where you're like, oh, this has been an awesome conversation. And this is one of my, like, I could, shout from the rooftops this stuff for the next you know till the end of time mm -hmm. um but this has been a really fun conversation and i i appreciate you both and what it is that that you're doing and i am honestly i'm humbled and privileged to um call you two colleagues and friends so yeah and we have started a revolution we have That's don't worry my it's it started bertha has <laughs> No, you shut my paradigm too. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I I am absolutely just tickled because, honest to goodness, I seriously I I am so glad that we started out the conversation the way we did because I have a new understanding, and I'm not afraid to say that hey, I I I was wrong in my perception, and and I, now I have the understanding of the duality of the idea of critical thinking. Um, skeptical thinking versus critical thinking. I, I that that tickles me that I've learned something new. I think honestly, I know we're ending this, but if you say to teach your critical thinking, they're not thinking what you're thinking. Right. Their their critical thinking is valid too. Right. So keep that in mind as you move forward that they think they're doing it. At least science teachers I know. Analyzing data, looking at data, stuff like that. It's done. It's done right. daily. We're not just shooting facts at them and making them answer questions in the back of the book. That was my first impression. Like, oh, you think I do? You think all I do is have them read the chapter and answer questions in the back of the book? No. Uh, right. Now I understand that that's not what you meant. Right. So, all right. Well, everyone, thank you all. Uh, I do appreciate everyone and everything that you guys have helped me to understand. I appreciate each of you. And uh, anybody else you have? Anything closing remarks before I hit the, the end recording? Join the revolution <laughs> and follow all of my friends here. All right. You guys, thank you.